This chapter discusses relational databases. It is based upon our book, Principles of Database Management, published by Cambridge University Press. You can find more information about our book on the website at the bottom of my slide. My name is Bart Balsens, and I am one of the authors of the book. In this chapter, we first introduce the key building blocks of the relational model. Normalization is reviewed next, as a procedure to remove redundancies and anomalies from a relational data model. We also discuss how to map both ER and EER conceptual data models to a logical relational data model. We kick off by introducing the basic concepts of the relational model and then formally define them in the next section. This is followed by an overview of the different types of keys, which are an essential building block of the relational model. The relational constraints are summarized next, followed by an example of a relational data model. Relational databases implement the relational model, which is one of the most popular logical and internal data models in use nowadays. It was first formalized by Edgar F. Cott in his seminal paper, A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks, which appeared in the well-respected journal Communications of the ACM already in 1970. The relational model is a formal data model with a sound mathematical foundation based on set theory and first order predicate logic. Unlike the ER and EER models, the relational model has no standard graphical representation which makes it unsuitable as a conceptual data model. Given its solid theoretical underpinning, the relational model is commonly adopted to build both logical and internal data models. Many commercial RDBMSs exist which implement the relational model. Popular examples are Microsoft SQL Server, IBM DB2 and Oracle. In the relational model, a database is represented as a collection of relations. A relation is defined as a set of tuples that each represent a similar real-world entity, such as a product, a supplier, an employee, etc. A tuple is an ordered list of attribute values that each describe an aspect of this entity, such as supplier number, supplier name, supplier address, etc. A relation can be visualized as a table of values. This figure illustrates a relation supplier. Table names, such as supplier, and column names, such as supplier number, supplier name, etc., are used to help in interpreting the meaning of the values in each row. Each tuple corresponds to a row in the table. Attribute types such as supplier number, supplier name, etc. can be seen as the column names. Each attribute corresponds to a single cell. A relation corresponds to an entity type in the EER model. A tuple to an entity a column name to an attribute type, and a single cell to an attribute. To facilitate understanding, it is recommended to use meaningful names for each relation and its attribute types. Here you can see some examples of relations. The student relation has attribute types student number, name, home phone, and address. 
The professor relation has attribute types social security number, name, home phone, office phone, and email. And the course relation has attribute types course number and course name. The meaning of the relations and their attribute types is clear from the naming. Before we can formally define a relation, we need to introduce the concept of a domain. The domain specifies the range of admissible values for an attribute type. For example, a domain can consist of all integer values between 1 and 9999 and can be used to define the attribute type supplier number. Each attribute type of a relation is defined using a corresponding domain. A domain can be used multiple, time, multiple times in a relation. Assume we define a domain representing integer values between 1 and 9,999. Let's say we then want to build a relation bill of material, representing which product is made up of which other product in what quantity. Think of a bike with product number 5 consisting of two wheels, a wheel has product number 10, a wheel in turn consisting of 30 spokes, a spoke has product number 15. This can be represented as a relation bill of material with major product number representing the composite object, minor product number representing the part object, and the quantity as illustrated here with some example tuples. Or domain can now be used to define the attribute types major product number and minor product number. An advantage of using a domain here is that if the product numbers would ever have to change, such as between 1 and 99,999, then this change should only be done in the domain definition, which seriously improves the maintainability of our relational model. A relation R, A1, A2, A3, up to AN, can, can now be formally defined as a set of M tuples, R equals T1, T2, T3 to Tm, where each tuple T is an ordered list of N values, T equals V1, V2, V3, up to Vn, corresponding to a particular entity, such as a particular supplier. Each value, Vi, is an element of the corresponding domain, DOM AI or is a special null value. A null value means that the value is missing, irrelevant or not applicable. Some example tuples for the student, professor and course relations are shown here. It is important to note that a relation essentially represents a set. Hence, there is no logical ordering of tuples in a relation. A relation also does not have any duplicate tuples. There is, however, an ordering to the values within a tuple based upon how the relation was defined. The domain constraint of the relational model states that the value of each attribute type A must be an atomic and single value from the domain DOM A. Suppose we have a relation course with attribute types course number, course name, and study points as shown here. Two example tuples are also shown. The first tuple is correct, specifying course number 10, principles of database management with six, with six study points. The second tuple is incorrect as it specifies two values for the course name, principles of database management and database modeling. A relation R of degree N on the domains DOM A1, DOM A2, DOM A3 up to DOM AN can also be alternative, alternatively defined as a subset of the Cartesian product of the domains that define each of the attribute types. 
Remember, the Cartesian product specifies all possible combinations of values from the underlying domains. Of all these possible combinations, the current relation state represents only the valid tuples that represent a specific state of the real world. You can see this illustrated in the figure. We have three domains. Product idea, defined as an integer between 1 and 9999. Product color, defined as either blue, red or black. And product category, defined as either A, B or C. The Cartesian product of these three domains then simply lists all possible combinations as shown in the bottom table. Or relation R will then be a subset of all these combinations. Keys are a very important concept in the relational model to uniquely identify tuples as well as to establish relationships between relations. In what follows, we discuss superkeys and keys, candidate keys, primary keys, alternative keys, and foreign keys. As we already mentioned, a relation is a set of tuples. Hence, per the mathematical definition of a set, all tuples in a relation must be distinct. No two tuples can have the same combination of values for all their attribute types. A superkey is defined as a subset of attribute types of a relation R, with the property that no two tuples in any relation state should have the same combination of values for these attribute types. In other words, a superkey specifies a uniqueness constraint in the sense that no distinct no two distinct tuples in a state can have the same value for the superkey. Every relation has at least one default superkey, the set of all its attribute types. A superkey can have redundant attribute types. As an example, for the relation student, with student number, name, and home phone, let me do that again. As an example, for the relation student, student number, name, home phone is a superkey, but note that both name and home phone are redundant and student number is a superkey as such. A key K of a relation scheme R is a superkey of R with the additional property that removing any attribute type from K leaves a set of attribute types that is no super key of R. Hence, a key does not have any redundant attribute types and is also called a minimal super key. For a student relation, student number is a key. The key constraint states that every relation must have at least one key that allows to uniquely identify its tuples. In general, a relation may have more than one key. As an example, a product relation may have both a unique product number and a unique product name. Each of these keys is called a candidate key. One of them is designated as the primary key of the relation. In our product example, we can make product number the primary key. The primary key is used to identify tuples in the relation and to establish connections to other relations as we discuss in what follows. It can also be used for storage purposes and to define indexes in the internal data model. The attribute types that make up the primary key should always satisfy a not null constraint. Otherwise, it would not be possible to identify some tuples. This is called the Entity Integrity Constraint. The other candidate keys are then referred to as alternative keys. In our example, product name can be defined as an alternative key. 
Note that optionally, a not null constraint can also be specified for the other attribute types, such as the alternative keys. Like relationship types in the EER model, relations in the relational model can be connected. These connections are established through the concept of a foreign key. A set of attribute types FK in a relation R1 is a foreign key of R1 if two conditions are satisfied. First, the attribute types in FK have the same domains as the primary key attribute types PK of a relation R2. Next, a value FK in a tuple T1 of the current state R1 either occurs as a value of PK for some tuple T2 in the current state R2 or is null. These conditions for a foreign key specify a so-called referential integrity constraint between two relations, R1 and R2. To the left of this figure, you can see our EER relationship type on order, which says, a supplier can have minimum zero and maximum end purchase orders, whereas a purchase order is always connected to minimum one and maximum one, or in other words, exactly one supplier. How can we now map this EER relationship type to the relational model? A first attempt could be to add purchase order number as a foreign key to the supplier table. However, since a supplier can have multiple purchase orders, this would create a multi-valued attribute type, which is not allowed in the relational model. A better option is to include supplier number as a foreign key in the purchase order table, since every purchase order is connected to exactly one supplier. Since the minimum cardinality is 1, this foreign key should be declared as not null. In our example, you can see that purchase order number 1511 is supplied by supplier number 37, whose name is Ad Fundum, and purchase order number 1512 is supplied by supplier number 94, which is the wine crate. Here you can see another example. We have an end to end relationship type between supplier and product. A supplier can supply zero to n products, whereas a product can be supplied by zero to m suppliers. How can we map this n to m relationship type to the relational model? We could add a foreign key product number to the supplier table. However, since a supplier can supply multiple products, this would create a multi-valued attribute type which is not allowed. Alternatively, we could also add supplier number as a foreign key to the product relation. Unfortunately, the same problem arises since a product can be supplied by multiple suppliers. The solution is to create a new relation supplies, which includes two foreign keys, supplier number and product number, that together make up the primary key of the relation as illustrated here. Note, that we also added the attribute types of the EER relationship type to this relation, purchase price and delivery period. You can see that this relation perfectly models the N to M cardinalities. Supplier number 21 can supply product numbers 289, 327 and 347. Vice versa, product number 347 can be supplied by supplier numbers 21, 69 and 84. As mentioned before, the relational model supports various integrity constraints on the values of the attribute types. These constraints aim to ensure that the data is always correct and consistent. The RDMS will have to take care that the integrity constraints are always checked and violations reported if the database state is updated. This table summarizes all relational constraints we have discussed thus far.
Here you can see an example of a relational data model for the purchase order administration. The relational model includes five relations, supplier, product, supplies, purchase order, and PO line. Each relation has a set of corresponding attribute types. Note that primary keys are underlined and foreign keys have been put in italics. As an example, the foreign key SUP number and product number in the supplies relation refer to the primary keys SUP number and product number in the supplier and product relation, respectively. This figure shows an example of a corresponding relational database state. Note that each tuple has atomic and single values for each of its attribute types as required by the domain constraint. Normalization of a relational model is a process of analyzing the given relations to ensure that they do not contain any redundant data. The goal of normalization is to ensure that no anomalies can occur during data insertion, deletion, or update. A step-by-step -step procedure needs to be followed to transform an unnormalized relational model to a normalized relational model. In what follows, we start by discussing the data anomalies that can occur when working with an unnormalized relational model. Next, we outline some informal normalization guidelines. This is followed by defining two concepts which are fundamental building blocks of a normalization procedure, functional dependencies and prime attribute types. Both will then be extensively used when discussing the normalization forms in the next section. This figure shows an example of a relational data model where we only have two relations with all the information. You see that the supplies relation also includes all the attribute types for suppliers such as supplier name, supplier address, etc. and all the attribute types for product such as product number, product type, etc. You can also see that the PO line relation now includes purchase order date and supplier number. Both relations contain duplicate information, which may easily lead to inconsistencies. In the supplies table, for example, all supplier and product information is repeated for each tuple, which creates a lot of redundant information. Because of this redundant information, this relational model is called an unnormalized relational model. At least three types of anomalies may arise when working with an unnormalized relational model, an insertion anomaly, a deletion anomaly, and an update anomaly. An insertion anomaly can occur when we wish to insert a new tuple in the supplies relation. We must then be sure to each time include the, collect, the correct supplier, such as supplier number, supplier name, address, etc., and product, such as product number, product name, product type, etc., information. Furthermore, in this unnormalized relational model, it is difficult to insert a new product for which there are no supplies yet, or a new supplier who does not supply anything yet, since the primary key is a combination of supplier number and product number, which can thus both not be null because of the entity integrity constraint. A deletion anomaly can occur if we would delete a particular supplier from the supplies relation. Consequently, all corresponding product data may get lost as well, which is not desirable. An update anomaly can occur when we wish to update the supplier address in the supplies relation. This would necessitate multiple updates with the risk of inconsistency. This figure shows another example relational data model and state for the purchase order administration. Let's now see how, how our 
insertion, deletion, and update operations discussed above work out here. Inserting a new tuple in the supplies relation can be easily done since the supplier name, address, etc. and the product name, product type, etc. are only stored once in the relations supplier and product. Inserting a new product for which there are no supplies yet or a new supplier who does not supply anything yet can be easily accomplished by adding new tuples to the product and supplier relation. Deleting a tuple from the supplier relation will not affect any product tuples in the product relation. Finally, if we wish to update the supplier address in the supplies relation, we only need to do one single update in the supplier table. As there are no inconsistencies or duplicate information in this relational model, it is also called a normalized relational model. To have a good relational data model, all relations in the model should be normalized. A formal normalization procedure can be applied to transform an unnormalized relational model into a, normali into a normalized form. The advantages are twofold. At the logical level, the users can easily understand the meaning of the data and formulate correct queries. At the implementation level, the storage space is used efficiently and the risk of inconsistent updates is reduced. Before we start discussing a formal step-by-step -step normalization procedure, let's review some informal normalization guidelines. First, it is important to design a relational model in such a way that it is easy to explain its meaning. Consider the example relation my relation 1, 2, 3. The name of the relation is not very meaningful. Hence, a better alternative would be to name it as supplier. Next, attribute types from multiple entity types should not be combined in a single relation do not cloud its interpretation. When looking back at the above relation, both supplier and product information are mixed. Hence, a better alternative would be to create two relations, supplier and product. Finally, avoid excessive amounts of null values in relation. For example, assume that sub Twitter has many null values because not many suppliers have a Twitter account. Hence, keeping it in the supplier relation implies a waste of memory capacity. A better option might be to split up the supplier relation in two relations, supplier and supplier Twitter, whereby the latter includes supplier number as a foreign key and primary key, and sub Twitter as illustrated. Before we can start discussing various normalization steps, we need to introduce two important concepts, functional dependency and prime attribute type. A functional dependency X to Y between two sets of attribute types X and Y implies that a value of X uniquely determines a value of Y. We also say that there is a functional dependency from X to Y or that Y is functionally dependent on X. As an example, the employee name is functionally dependent upon the social security number. In other words, a social security number uniquely determines an employee name. The other way around does not necessarily apply since multiple employees can share the same name. Hence, one employee name may correspond to multiple social security numbers. A project number uniquely determines a project name and a project location. Project name and project location are thus functionally dependent upon project number. The number of hours an employee worked on a project is functionally dependent upon both the social security number 
and the project number. A prime attribute type is another important concept that is needed in the normalization process. A prime attribute type is an attribute type that is part of a candidate key. Consider the relation R1. The key of the relation is a combination of social security number and P number. Both social security number and P number are prime attribute types, whereas P name and hours are non-prime attribute types. Normalization of a relational model is a process of analyzing the given relations based on their functional dependencies and candidate keys to minimize redundancy and insertion, deletion and update anomalies. The normalization procedure entails various normal form tests, which are typically sequentially evaluated. Unsatisfactory relations that do not meet the normal form tests are decomposed into smaller relations. In what follows, we discuss the first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, Boyce-Scott normal form, and fourth normal form. The first normal form states that every attribute type of a relation must be atomic and single-valued. Hence, no composite or multi-valued attribute types are tolerated. This is the same as the domain constraint we introduced earlier. Consider the supplier relation in the second bullet. This relation is not in first normal form, since it contains a composite attribute type name, which consists of the attribute types first name and last name. We can bring it in first normal form as illustrated in the bullet below. In other words, composite attribute types need to be decomposed in their parts to bring the relation in first normal form. Suppose we have a relation department as shown in the first bullet. It has a department number, a department location, and a foreign key referring to the social security number of the employee who manages the department. Assume now that a department can have multiple locations and that multiple departments are possible at a given location. The relation is not in first normal form since delocation is a multi-valued attribute type. We can bring it in first normal form. We can bring it in first normal form by removing delocation from department and putting it into a new relation, deplocation, together with D number as a foreign key, as shown in the second and third bullet. The primary key of this new relation is then the combination of both, since a department can have multiple locations, and multiple departments can share a location. This figure illustrates some example tuples. You can see that department number 15 has two locations, New York and San Francisco. Department number 30 also has two locations, Chicago and Boston. The two tables below bring it in the first normal form, since every attribute type of both relations is now atomic and single-valued. To summarize, multi-valued attribute types such as delocation, should be removed and put in a separate relation, such as dep location, along with the primary key, such as D number, of the original uh, relation, such as department, as a foreign key. The primary key of the new relation is then a combination of the multivalued attribute type and the primary key of the original relation, or in this case, D number and D location. Let's give one more example. Say we have a relation R1 with employee information such as social security number, E name, D number, D name, 
and project, which is a composite attribute type consisting of P number, P name, and hours as shown in the first bullet. Let's assume an employee can work on multiple projects and multiple employees can work on the same project. Hence, we have a multi-valued composite attribute type project in orrelation R1. In other words, both conditions of the first normal form are clearly violated. To bring it in first normal form, we create two relations, R11 and R12, where the latter includes the project attribute types together with social security number as a foreign key as shown in the second and third bullet. The primary key of R12 is then a combination of social security number and P number. Since an employee can work on multiple projects and multiple employees can work on a project. Before we can start discussing the second normal form, we need to introduce the concepts of full and partial functional dependency. A functional dependency x to y is a full functional dependency. If removal of any attribute type A from X means that the dependency does not hold anymore. For example, hours is fully functionally dependent upon both social security number and P number. More specifically, to know the number of hours an employee worked on a project, we need to know both the social security number of the employee and the project number. Likewise, project name is fully functionally dependent upon project number. A functional dependency x to y is a partial dependency if an attribute type A from x can be removed from x and the dependency still holds. As an example, P name is partially functionally dependent upon social security number and P number. It only depends upon P number and not on social security number. A relation R is in the second normal form if it satisfies the first normal form, and every non-prime attribute type A in R is fully functional de functionally dependent on any key of R. In case a relation is not in second normal form, we must decompose it and set up a new relation for each partial key together with its dependent attribute type types. Also, it is important to keep a relation with the original primary key and any attribute types that are fully functionally dependent on it. Let's illustrate this with an example. Say we have a relation R1 with attribute type social security number, P number, P name, hours as shown here. It contains both project information and information about which employee worked on what project for how many hours. The assumptions are as follows. An employee can work on multiple projects. Multiple employees can work on the same project and a project has a unique name. The relation R1 is in first normal form since there are no multivalued or composite attribute types. However, it is not in second normal form. The primary key of the relation R1 is a combination of social security number and P number. The attribute type P name is not fully functionally dependent on the primary key. It only depends on P number. Hours, however, is fully functionally dependent upon both social security number and P number. Hence, we need to remove the attribute type P name and put it in a new relation R12 together with P number as shown in the second and third bullet. The relation R11 can then be called works on, and the relation R12 can be referred to as project. This figure illustrates how to bring a relation into second normal form with some example tuples. Note the redundancy in the original relation. 
The name Hadoop is repeated multiple times, which is not desirable from a storage perspective. Also, if we would like to update it, for example from Hadoop to Big Data, then multiple changes need to take place. This is not the case for the two normalized relations at the bottom, where the updates should only be done once in the project relation. To discuss the third normal form, we need to introduce the concept of transitive dependency. A functional dependency x to y in a relation R is a transitive dependency if there is a set of attribute types z that is neither a candidate key nor a subset of any key of R and both z is functionally dependent on x and y is functionally dependent on z. A relation is in the third normal form if it satisfies the second normal form and no non-prime attribute type of R is transitively dependent on the primary key. If this is not the case, we need to decompose the relation R and set up a relation that includes the non-key attribute types that functionally determine the other non-key attribute types. Let's work out an example to illustrate this. The relation R1 contains information about employees and departments as shown in the first bullet. The social security number attribute type is the primary key of the relation. The assumptions are as follows. An employee works in one department. A department can have multiple employees and a department has one manager. Given these assumptions, we have two transitive dependencies in R. D name is transitively dependent on social security number via D number. In other words, D number is functionally dependent on social security number and D name is functionally dependent on D number. Likewise, D manager's social security number is transitively dependent on social security number via D number. In other words, the number is functionally dependent on social security number and the manager's social security number is functionally dependent on the number. The number is not a candidate key nor a subset of any key. Hence, the relation is not in third normal form. To bring it in third normal form, we remove the attribute type D name and D manager's social security number and put them in a new relation R12 together with D number as its primary key as shown in the second and third bullet. The relation R11 can be called employee and the relation R12 can be referred to as department. This figure shows some example tuples for both the unnormalized and normalized relations. Note the redundancy in the unnormalized case, where the values marketing for D name and 210 for D manager's social security number are repeated multiple times. This is not the case for the normalized relations, where these values are only stored once. We can now continue and discuss the boy scout normal form, also referred to as the three and a half normal form. Let's first introduce another concept. A functional dependency x to y is called a trivial functional dependency if y is a subset of x. An example of a trivial functional dependency is between social security number and name and social security number. A relation R is in the boy scout normal form, provided that for each of its non-trivial functional dependencies x to y, x is a super key. That is, x is either a candidate key or a superset thereof. It can be shown that the boy scout normal form is stricter than the third normal form. Hence, every relation in boy scout normal form is also in third normal form. However, the relation in third normal form is not necessarily in boy scout normal form. 
Let's give an example. Suppose we have a relation R1 with attribute type supplier number, supplier name, product number, and quantity. It models information about which supplier can supply what products in what quantities. The assumptions are as follows. A supplier can supply multiple products. A product can be supplied by multiple suppliers. And a supplier has a unique name. Therefore, supplier number and product number are a super key of the relation. Further, we have a non-trivial functional dependency between supplier number and supplier name. The relation is thus not in Boyce-Cott normal form. To bring it in Boyce-Cott normal form, we remove supplier name from R1 and put it in a new relation R12 together with supplier number as the primary key as shown in the second and third bullet. The relation R11 can be called supplies, and the relation R12 can be referred to as supplier. We can conclude by discussing the fourth normal form. First, we introduce a concept of a multivalued dependency. There is a multivalued dependency from x to y if and only if each x value exactly determines a set of y values independently of the other attribute types. A relation is in the fourth normal form if it is in the Boyce-Cott normal form, and for every one of its non-trivial multivalued dependencies x to y, x is a superkey. That is, x is either a candidate key or a superset thereof. Let's illustrate this with an example. Suppose we have a relation R1, including information about courses, instructors, and textbooks. The assumptions are as follows. A course can be taught by different instructors, and a course uses the same set of textbooks for each instructor. Hence, we have a multivalued dependency between course and textbook. In other words, each course exactly determines a set of textbooks, independently of the instructor. To bring it in fourth normal form, we create two relations. R11 with course and textbook, and R12 with course and instructor, as shown in the second and third bullet. This figure shows some example tuples for the unnormalized and normalized relations. You can spot the redundancy in the former case. Suppose a new textbook would be added to the course database management. In the unnormalized case, this would imply adding as many tuples as there are instructors teaching it, or two in our case. In the normalized case, only one tuple needs to be added. There exists a plethora of database modeling tools that allow the database designer to draw an EER model and automatically generate a relational data model from it. If the correct translation rules are applied, the resulting relational model will automatically be normalized. Therefore, although the translation can be automated, it is useful to study these rules in detail. They provide us with valuable insights into the intricacies of good database design and the consequences of certain design decisions by linking relational concepts to their EER counterparts. In this section, we discuss how to map a conceptual ER model to a relational model. More specifically, we discuss mapping entity types, relationship types, multivalued attribute types, and weak entity types. We conclude with a summary overview and example. The first step is to map each entity type into a relation. 
simple attribute types can be directly mapped. A composite attribute type needs to be decomposed into its component attribute types. One of the key attribute types of the entity type can be set as the primary key of the relation. You can see this illustrated in the figure. We have two entity types, employee and project. We create relations for both. The employee entity type has three attribute types, social security number, which is the key attribute type, address, which is considered as an atomic attribute type, and ename, which is a composite attribute type consisting of first name and last name. The project entity type also has three attribute types. P number, which is the key attribute type, P name, and P duration. You can see that both key attribute types, social security number and P number, have been mapped to the primary keys of both relations. Also note that the E name composite attribute type has been decomposed into first name and last name in the relation employee. Once we have mapped the entity types, we can continue with the relationship types. The mapping depends upon the degree and cardinalities as we illustrate in what follows. For a binary one-to-one -one relationship type, we create two relations, one for each entity type participating in the relationship type. The connection can be made by including a foreign key in one of the relations to the primary key of the other. In case of existence dependency, we put the foreign key in the existence dependent relation and declare it as not null. The attribute, types, the attribute types of the one-to-one -one relationship type can then be added to the relation with the foreign key. Let's consider the manager's relationship type between employee and department as depicted here. Remember, an employee manages either zero or one department whereas a department is managed by exactly one employee, which means department is existence dependent on employee. We first create relations for both entity types and add the corresponding attribute types. The question now is how to map the relationship type. One option would be to add a foreign key, department number, to the employee relation, which refers to the primary key department number in department as shown here. This foreign key can be null, since not every employee manages a department. Let's now find out how many of the four cardinalities of the relationship type are correctly modeled. We start from department. Can a department have zero managers? Yes, this is the case for department number two, the call center, which has no manager assigned as its department number two does not appear in the department number column of the employee table. Also, the ICT department has no manager. Can a department have more than one manager? Yes. This is the case for department number one, marketing, which, which has two managers, employee 511, John Smith, and employee 564, Sarah Adams. Can an employee manage zero departments? Yes, this is the case for Emma Lucas and Michael Johnson. Can an employee manage more than one department? No, since the employee relation is normalized and the foreign key department number should thus be single valued as required by the first normal form. 
To summarize, out of the four cardinalities, only two are supported. Moreover, this option generates a lot of new values for the department number foreign key, as there are typically many employees who are not managing any department. Another option would be to include social security number as a foreign key in department, referring to social security number in employee as shown here. This foreign key should be declared as not null, since every department should have exactly one manager. Let's now also look at the other cardinalities. Can you have employees that manage zero departments? Yes, this is the case for Emma Lucas, since her social security number, 356, is not appearing in the social security number column of the department table. Can we make sure that an employee manages at most one department? In fact, we cannot. As you can see, John Smith manages three departments. Hence, out of the four cardinalities, three are supported. This option is to be preferred above the previous one, although it's not perfect. The semantics lost in the mapping should be documented and followed up using application code. Binary one-to-n relationship types can be mapped by including a foreign key in the relation corresponding to the participating entity type at the end side of the relationship type. The foreign key refers to the primary key of the relation corresponding to the entity type at the one side of the relationship type. Depending upon the minimum cardinality, the foreign key can be declared as not null or null allowed. The attribute types of the one to n relationship type can be added to the relation corresponding to the participating entity type. The works in relationship type is an example of a one to n relationship type. An employee works in exactly one department, whereas a department can have one to n employees working in it. The attribute type starting date represents the date at which an employee started working in a department. As with one to one relationships, we first create the relations employee and department for both entity types. We can again explore two options to establish the relationship type in the relational model. Since the department can have multiple employees, we cannot add a foreign key to it, as this would create a multi-valued attribute type which is not tolerated in the relational model. That's why we add department number as a foreign key to the employee relation. Since the minimum cardinality is one, this foreign key is defined as not null, ensuring that an employee works in exactly one department. What about the other cardinalities? Well, let's find out. Can a department have more than one employee? Yes, this is the case for the marketing department, which has two employees, John Smith, and Paul Barker. Can we guarantee that every department has at least one employee? In fact, we cannot. The finance and ICT departments have no employees working in them. Out of the four cardinalities, three are supported. Note that the attribute type starting date has also been added to the employee relation. M to N relationship types are mapped by introducing a new relation R. The primary key of R is a combination of foreign keys referring to the primary keys of the relations corresponding to the participating entity types. 
the attribute types of the M to N relationship type can also be added to R. The works on relationship type shown here is an example of an M to N relationship type. An employee works on zero to N projects, whereas a project is being worked on by zero to M employees. We start by creating relations for both entity types. We cannot add a foreign key to the employee relation as this would give us a multi-valued attribute type since an employee can work on multiple projects. Likewise, we cannot add a foreign key to the project relation as a project is being worked on by multiple employees. In other words, we need to create a new relation to map the ER relationship type works on. The works on relation has two foreign keys, social security number and project number, which together make up the primary key and therefore cannot be null. Remember the entity integrity constraint. The hours attribute type is also added to this relation. Here you can see some example tuples of the employee, project, and works on relations. All four cardinalities are successfully modeled. Emma Lucas does not work on any projects, whereas Paul Barker works on two projects. Vice versa, projects 1002 and 1004 have no employees assigned, whereas project 1001 has two employees assigned. Now let's see what happens if we change the assumptions as follows. An employee works on at least one project and a project is being worked on by at least one employee. In other words, the minimum cardinalities change to one on both sides. Essentially, the solution remains the same and you can see that none of the minimum cardinalities are supported. Since Emma Lucas is not working on any projects, and projects 1002 and 1004 have no employees assigned. Out of the two cardinalities, only two are supported. This will require close follow-up during application development to make sure these missing cardinalities are enforced by the applications instead of the data model. Unary or recursive relationship types can be mapped depending upon the cardinality. A recursive one-to-one -one or one-to-n relationship type can be implemented by adding a foreign key referring to the primary key of the same relation. For an n-to-m recursive relationship type, a new relation R needs to be created with two not null foreign keys referring to the original relation. It is recommended to use role names to clarify the meaning of the foreign keys. Let's illustrate this with some examples. Here you see a one-to-one -one unary relationship type modeling the supervision relationships between employees. It can be implemented in the relational model by adding a foreign key, supervisor, to the employee relation which refers to its primary key, social security number, as illustrated. The foreign key can be null, since, according to the R model, it is possible that an employee is supervised by zero other employees. Since the foreign key cannot be multivalued, an employee cannot be supervised by more than one other employee. This is illustrated here. Some employees do not supervise other employees like Emma Lucas. However, some employees supervise more than one other employee like Paul Barker, who supervises both John Smith and Emma Lucas. To summarize, out of the four cardinalities, three are supported by our model. Let's now change one assumption as follows. An employee can supervise at least zero, at most, 
and other employees. The relational model stays the same, with supervisor as foreign key referring to social security number. In this case, all four cardinalities can be perfectly captured by our relational model. Let's now set both maximum cardinalities to N and M respectively. In other words, an employee can supervise 0 to N employees, whereas an employee can be supervised by 0 to M employees. We can no longer add a foreign key to the employee relation, as this would result into a multi-valued attribute type. Hence, we need to create a new relation, supervision, with two foreign keys, supervisor and supervisee, which both refer to social security number in employee. Since both foreign keys make up the primary key, they cannot be null. All four cardinalities are perfectly supported, as you can see here. Emma Lucas and John Smith are not supervising anyone. And Dan Kelly is not being supervised by anyone. So both minimum cardinalities equal zero. Paul Barker and Dan Kelly supervise two employees each, hence maximum cardinality N. And John Smith is being supervised by both Paul Barker and Dan Kelly, hence maximum cardinality M. Note, however, that if one or both minimum cardinalities would have been one, then the relational model would have essentially stayed the same, such that it could not accommodate this. Hence, these minimum cardinalities would have to be again be enforced by the application programs, which is not an efficient solution. To map an entry relationship type, we first create relations for each participating entity type. We then also define one additional relation R to represent the entry relationship type and add foreign keys referring to the primary keys of each of the relations corresponding to the participating entity types. The primary key of R is the combination of all foreign keys, which are all not null. Any attribute type of the entry relationship can also be added to R. Let's illustrate this with an example. The relationship type booking is a ternary relationship type between tourist, booking and travel agency. It has one attribute type, price. The relational model has relations for each of the three entity types together with a relation booking for the relationship type. The primary key of the booking relation is the combination of the three foreign keys, as you can see illustrated. It also includes the price attribute type. All six cardinalities are perfectly represented in the relational model. The relationship type offers is a ternary relationship type between instructor, course, and semester. An instructor offers a course during zero to end semesters. During a semester, a course should be offered by at least one, at most, N instructors. During a semester, an instructor can offer zero to N courses. As with the previous example, the relational model has one relation per entity type and one relation for the relationship type. Let's now have a look at the cardinalities. Here you can see some example tuples. Note that the course number 110, Analytics, is not offered during any semester. Some other courses are not offered in all semesters. Hence, the minimum cardinality of 1 stating that during a semester course should be offered by at least one instructor cannot be guaranteed by the relational model.
For each multivalued attribute type, we create a new relation R. We put the multivalued attribute type in R together with a foreign key referring to the primary key of the original relation. Multivalued composite attribute types are again decomposed into their components. The primary key can then be set based upon the assumptions. Let's say we have a multivalued attribute type phone number, as you can see here. An employee can have multiple phones. We create a new relation, mPhone. It has two attribute types, phone number and social security number. The latter is a foreign key referring to the employee relation. If we assume that each phone number is, is assigned to only one employee, then the attribute type phone number suffices as primary key of the relation M phone. Let's now change the assumption such that a phone number can be shared by multiple employees. Hence, phone number is no longer appropriate as primary key of the relation. Also, social security number cannot be assigned as primary key since an employee can have multiple phone numbers. Hence, the primary key becomes the combination of both phone number and social security number as illustrated. Some example tuples are depicted here where you can see that tuples 1 and 2 of the M phone relation have the same value for phone number, whereas tuples 2 and 3 have the same value for social security number. This example illustrates how the business specifics can help define the primary key of a relation. Remember, a weak entity type is an entity type that cannot produce its own key attribute type and is existence dependent on an owner entity type. It should be mapped into relation R with all of its corresponding attribute types. Next, a foreign key must be added referring to the primary key of the relation corresponding to the owner entity type. Because of the existence dependency, the foreign key is declared as not null. The primary key of R is then the combination of the partial key and the foreign key. Here you can see our earlier example. Room is a weak entity type and needs to borrow H number from hotel to define a key attribute type, which is the combination of R number and H number. We can map both entity types to the relational model as illustrated. Room has a foreign key, H number, which is declared as not null and refers to hotel. Its primary key is a combination of R number and H number. Some example tuples are depicted here. All four cardinalities are nicely supported by the relational model. In the previous sections, we extensively discussed how to map the ER model to a relational model. This table summarizes how the key concepts of both models are related. Here you can see the resulting relational model for our employee administration ER model. Let's briefly discuss it. The primary key of the employee relation is social security number. It has two foreign keys. Manager number refers to social security number and implements the recursive supervised by relationship and D number which refers to department and implements the works in relationship type. The former is null allowed whereas the latter is not. The primary key of department is department number. 
It has one foreign key manager number, which refers to social security number in employee and implements the manager's relationship type. It cannot be null. The primary key of project is project number. The foreign key, department number, refers to department. It implements the in charge of relationship type and cannot be null. The works on relation is needed to implement the M2N relationship type between employee and project. Its primary key is made up of two foreign keys referring to employee and project, respectively. It also includes the relationship type attribute hours representing how many hours an employee worked on a project. As we already mentioned, a relational model is not a perfect mapping of our ER model. Some of the cardinalities have not been perfectly translated. More specifically, we cannot guarantee that a department has at minimum one employee, not considering the manager. Another example is that the same employee can be manager of multiple departments. Some of the earlier mentioned shortcomings for the ER model still apply here as well. We cannot guarantee that a manager of a department also works in a department. We can also not enforce that employees should work on projects assigned to departments to which they belong. The ER model builds upon the ER model by introducing additional modeling constructs, such as a specialization, categorization, and aggregation. In what follows, we discuss how these can be mapped to the relational model. ER specializations can be mapped in various ways. The first option is to create a relation for the superclass and each subclass and link them with foreign keys. Another alternative is to create a relation for each subclass and none for the superclass. Finally, we can create one relation with all attribute types of the superclass and subclasses and add a special attribute type. Let's explore these options in more detail with some examples. Here you can see an ER specialization of artist into singer and actor. The specialization is partial, since not all artists are either a singer or an actor. It also has overlap, since some singers can also be actors. An artist has an artist number and an artist name. A singer has a music style. In our first option, we create three relations, one for the superclass and two for the subclasses as illustrated. We add a foreign key a artist number to each subclass relation which refers to the superclass relation. These foreign keys then also serve as primary keys. This figure illustrates option 1 with some example tuples. The solution works well in case the specialization is partial. Not all artists are included in the subclass relations. For example, Claude Monet is only included in the superclass relation and not referred in any of the subclass relations. In case the specialization would have been total instead of partial, then we could not have enforced it with this solution. The overlap characteristic is also nicely modeled. You can see that Madonna is referenced both in the singer and actor relations. In case the specialization would have been disjoint instead of overlap, then again, we could not have enforced it with this solution. Let's now change the specialization to total instead of partial. In other words, we assume all artists are either singers or actors. Option 1 would not work well for this, since there could be artist tuples which are not refer referenced in either the singer or actor relation. In this case, a better option, option 2, to map this ER specialization only creates relations for the subclasses as illustrated here. The attribute types of the superclass have been added to each of the subclass relations. 
At the bottom, you can see some example tuples for option 2. Obviously, this solution only works for a total specialization. The overlap characteristic can also be supported. You can see that Madonna is included in both relations. Note, however, that this creates redundancy. If we would also store her biography, picture, etc., then this information needs to be added to both relations, which is not that efficient from a storage perspective. Note that this approach cannot enforce a specialization to be disjoint, since the tuples in both relations can overlap. Another option, option 3, is to store all superclass and subclass information into one relation, as you can see illustrated here. An attribute type discipline is then added to the relation to indicate the subclass. At the bottom, you can see some example tuples for option 3. The values that can be assigned to the attribute type discipline depend upon the characteristics of the specialization. Hence, all specialization options are supported. Note, however, that this approach can generate a lot of new values for the subclass specific attribute types, such as music style in our case. In a specialization lattice, a subclass can have more than one superclass, as you can see illustrated here. A PhD student is both an employee and a student. This can be implemented in the relational model by defining three relations, employee, student, and PhD student, as shown. The primary key of the latter is a combination of two foreign keys, referring to employee and student, respectively. This solution does not support a total specialization, since we cannot enforce that all employee and student tuples are referenced in the PhD student relation. Another extension provided by the ER model is the concept of a categorization. As shown here, the category subclass is a subset of the union of the entities of the superclasses. Therefore, an account holder can either be a person or a company. This can be implemented in the relational model by creating a new relation, account holder, that corresponds to the category and adding the corresponding attribute types to it as illustrated. We then define a new primary key attribute type, customer number, also called a surrogate key for the relation that corresponds to the category. This surrogate key is then added as a foreign key to each relation corresponding to a superclass of the category. This foreign key is declared as not null for a total categorization and null allowed for a partial categorization. In case the superclasses happen to share the same key attribute type, then this one can be used and there is no need to define a surrogate key. This is illustrated here. In our case, the categorization is partial, since Wilfrid and Microsoft are no account holders, hence the null values. Note that this solution is not perfect. We cannot guarantee that the tuples of the category relation are a subset of the union of the tuples of the superclasses. As an example, customer number 12 in the account holder relation does not appear in neither the person nor company relation. Moreover, we cannot avoid that a tuple in the person relation and a tuple in the company relation would have the same value for customer number, which means they would refer to the same account holder tuple. In that case, this account holder would be a person and a company at the same time, which is incorrect as well. Aggregation is the third extension provided by the ER model. In the figure above, we aggregated the two entity types consultant and project 
and their relationship type into an aggregate called participation. This aggregate has an attribute type date and participates in a, M to, in a 1 to M relationship type with the entity type contract. This can be implemented in the relational model by creating four relations, consultant, project, participation, and contract as illustrated. The participation relation models the aggregation. Its primary key is a combination of two foreign keys, referring to the consultant and project relations. It includes a not null foreign key to the contract relation to model the relationship type. It also includes the attribute type date. In this chapter, we have discussed a relational model as one of the most popular data models used in the industry nowadays. After having formally introduced its basic building blocks, we elaborated on different types of keys. Next, we reviewed various relational constraints, which ensure that the data in the relational database has the desired properties. Normalization was extensively covered. First, we illustrated the need to guarantee no redundancy or anomalies in a data model. Functional dependencies and prime attribute types were introduced as important concepts during the normalization procedure, which brings the data model subsequently into first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, Boy Scott normal form, and finally, fourth normal form. The chapter concluded by discussing how both ER and EER conceptual data models can be mapped to a logical relational model. We extensively discussed the semantics that got lost during the mapping using plenty of examples. In case you want more information, I'm happy to refer to our book, Principles of Database Management. You find more information at the website at the bottom of my slide.